So we will move on to session two, which is um, the first talk keynote lecture will be by uh, Dr. Malika Goel on ocular manifestations of COVID-19 infection. Dr. Malika Goel is a vitreoretinal and uvia consultant at Apollo Hospitals in Hyderabad. Can we have her talk, please? Retinal sequelae of COVID-19 infection and its management, a consecutive case series treated at our hospital. Our cases can be classified as infections secondary to immunosuppression from COVID and its treatment and included endogenous endophthalmitis, candida retinitis, choroidal abscess, and mucormycosis causing central retinal artery occlusion, post-viral sequelae including acute macular neuroretinopathy, and paracentral acute middle maculopathy, bilateral prefovial hemorrhages, and post fever retinitis. Treatment related adverse effects, including central serous retinopathy associated with steroid use and voriconazole related visual symptoms. Our first patient was a 46 year old male uh, who presented in October last year with symptoms um, of endophthalmitis of four weeks duration that started during his COVID infection, at which time he also developed diabetes. He was treated with pasplanar vitrectomy and intravitreal antimicrobial agents. Vitreous microbiology was negative. He was placed on oral voriconazole and ciprofloxacin with complete resolution at six weeks. Our second endogenous endophthalmitis was a 72-year-old male uh, who was referred in July this year with features of endophthalmitis for six weeks that started during his COVID infection. He underwent vitrectomy with intravitreal antimicrobial agents and vitreous microbiology was positive for aspergillus flavors. He was placed on oral voriconazole with rapid initial improvement but subsequent worsening and he's still under treatment. In October last year, we had a 57 year old male who came for routine fundus screening as he had developed candidemia during his COVID infection. He was on intravenous fluconazole at this time. Evaluation revealed multiple uh, candida retinitis lesions in the right eye. We switched him from fluconazole to voriconazole because of its superior uh, vitreous bioavailability. There was initial improvement with subsequent worsening. So he was treated with intravitreal antimicrobial agents with uh, rapid resolution and uh, complete clearing of all lesions at 12 weeks after the injection. Now invasive candidiasis and candidemia has been reported with COVID-19 infection, but candida retinitis has not yet been reported. This was a 59 year old lady who presented in December last year with uh, blurring of vision for four weeks. There was a large choroidal abscess with inflammatory deposits. Uh, these uh, symptoms and signs had started during her COVID infection four weeks prior to presentation, at which time she had also developed diabetes. Uh, she was investigated for this lesion and all results were negative. Based on the clinical picture, she was placed on anti-tubercular therapy with rapid resolution at six weeks and complete clearing at six months. A systemic TB with COVID-19 infection has been reported, but not ocular tuberculosis. It is speculated that COVID-19 can activate dormant TB by altering host immunity. In May this year, we had a 68 year old male with the uh, complaints of red eye and vision drop. And uh, this had started uh, uh, two weeks after his COVID infection. He was on steroids when he came to us. Uh, we placed him on an additional uh, tablet levofloxacin and investigated him for this subretinal lesion. Toxoplasma IgG was positive in the serum and so tablet Bactrim was added to his treatment. And at six weeks, there was complete resolution of the lesion, uh, but we still do not know the etiology for this. In January this year, a 32-year-old male complained of uh, 
rap sudden onset of scotoma in his right eye for the last three days. He had recovered from COVID-19 four months prior. All his other investigations were negative. There was a deep uh, retinal grayish white lesion in the right eye corresponding to outer retinal layers disruption on the OCT. Additionally, there were hyperreflective lesions in the superficial retina on the OCT uh, with underlying shadowing. Similar lesions were seen in the other eye. So he appeared to have right eye symptomatic AMN and bilateral asymptomatic PAM. There are only two reports of these lesions in association with COVID-19 infection. In June this year, there was a 32-year-old lady uh, who complained of sudden deterioration of vision in both eyes due to pre-foveal hemorrhages. She had pseudomonas sepsis that she had contracted during her COVID infection. And at this time, she had severe thrombocytopenia. Eight weeks from onset, the prefovial hemorrhages had resolved completely with visual improvement. This was a 71-year-old male who presented in April this year with painless blurring of vision in the right eye for 20 days. He'd had COVID infection three months prior and then had some fever following that. He had been investigated by the referring physician for the retinitis and all investigations were negative. He had been on doxycycline for a week with no benefit. We saw him with retinitis and vitreous cells and haze and he was placed on oral steroids with rapid resolution at one week and complete resolution at eight weeks. This was a 24-year-old lady complaining of vision drop in the left eye for 10 to 15 days. She had been on oral steroids for the last three weeks for her COVID-19 management. Evaluation revealed a serious detachment at the macula, and this resolved uh, following discontinuation of steroids. In November last year, we had a 40-year-old male complaining of multiple visual symptoms for three weeks. He was on IV voriconazole uh, for management of systemic, systemic aspergillosis that he had contracted during his COVID infection. His medication review did not reveal any other medications responsible for the visual symptoms. Ocular evaluation and visual functions were within normal limits. We made a diagnosis of voriconazole induced visual disturbance. The dose of voriconazole was reduced with improvement of his symptoms within a week. However, the dose had to be stepped up later with recurrence of the visual symptoms. So voriconazole induced visual symptoms should be um, important diagnosis in COVID patients because many of these patients are on um, voriconazole for associated fungal infections, especially when the symptoms are associated with normal ocular evaluation an objective evaluation of visual functions. Thank you. Can you play the second video also? <coughs> she has one more video. Can you play the second video of Dr. Malika? She has sent only one video. Non-retinal manifestations, one more is there. Okay. No, no ma'am, she has sent only one video. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. We thank Dr. Mallika for highlighting the new entity of ocular manifestations of COVID with various manifestations, especially the fungal one, which is more challenging for us as a UVIT specialist. Whenever we see a snowball opacities, we do to think of immune mediated disease. Now with the post-COVID era, we are seeing a lot of fungal infections that needs to be differentiated from the immune mediated disease in this entity. Now we will move on to the next talk. We will have the discussions at the end along with other discussions. Next, I invite Dr. Vedanayaki, who's a UVATIS consultant from Aravind Eye Care System, right? She'll be talking to us on UVATIC cataracts. Over to Dr. Vedanayaki. Good morning, everyone. I'm Vedanayaki Rajesh. 
Okay, we are consultant from Arvind Aikar System Madurai. I first of all thank uh, KOS and the UVR team for giving me this opportunity. We will straight away go into my topic. My topic is UVIT cataract management. So the moment a surgeon looks at the UVIT cataract, the first thing that comes to his mind is a surgically demanding procedure. UVIT cataract is demanding not only in the intraoperative period, but also in the pre and postoperative period. So unless due diligence is given to control of inflammation in the preoperative period, even in a surgically good hands, the postoperative period is going to be very disastrous. With this intro, we'll go into the topic. UVIT cataract is one of the common complications of uveitis. It may be caused either by uncontrolled, unsustained inflammation or because of use of high dose, long duration of steroids. But there are few factors which, when properly modified preoperatively, can give a good postoperative outcome. It starts with UVIT diagnosis. Few UVIT conditions and few UVIT patients respond very well to therapy. If there is a good quiescence in the preoperative period, you will have a good postoperative outcome. Hence, the thumb root three months of quiescence. Do not rush up for cataract surgery in UVIT patients. And again, look for concomitant ocular pathology like optic nerve and macular involvement to predict the postoperative visual outcome. There are quite a few indications for cataract surgery in these patients. We can broadly divide them into two categories. Category one is a visually significant cataract with well-controlled inflammation. Usually these patients will have a good expected visual potential. While in category two, we have cataract impairing posterior segment visualization. So here we don't know what's happening in the posterior segment and the surgery is mainly for therapeutic purpose and to visualize the posterior segment. The management of uveitis cataract is different in different types of uveitis. We'll start with a good visual potential cataract that is Fuchs uveitis. You can operate on these patients even before three months of quiescence if they are on topical and oral steroids and they have a good postoperative visual outcome. The most common complication is progressive vitreous opacification. In some patients, it may be so dense that you may need a past pena vitrectomy in future. And in diagonally opposite quadrant, you have juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Usually these children present towards late because of their white eye uveitis with complications like uh, band-shaped keratopathy and cataract. There should be a proper balance between zero to cell tolerance and wait for cataract surgery because these children are there in their embryogenic age. So uh, too much of delay can cause poor postoperative visual outcome because of amblyopia. Next is Bechet's disease. Wait for even six months of period before planning cataract surgery, but even after that, they may have poor visual potential because of their optic nerve involvement. VKH, usually these patients have good visual outcome if their inflammation is well under control. Few of these patients may have pigmentary disturbances at the macula, which prevents us from early diagnosis of postoperative CME. So whenever you have a doubt that postoperative vision is not correlating with the clinical picture, do a OCT to diagnose CME early. Sympathetic ophthalmia, Unless the preoperative inflammation is well under control, the postoperative period can be disastrous. A lot of studies have said that there may be reactivation of toxo post cataract surgery, but in our clinic, we have not had such experiences. So once we have decided on planning cataract surgery, look for complicating features in these patients like corneal opacity, steral up, corneal thinning. Be ready to manage a shallow anterior chamber, posterior sinecare, and a fibrotic anterior capsule. So apart from your routine uh, surgical in, uh, investigations, you may need UVM to look at the ciliary body and zonules or the posterior capsule because in few patients, they may have had a secondary angle closure and a YAC PA, which can weaken the zonules locally. Or a few patients could have had intravitreal injections for their CME. They could have had a lens touch and a PC dehiscence. So you have to do a UVM preoperatively. Ultrasound will help to look at the posterior segment when the cataract is too dense, and OCT will help to look at the macular thickness and ERM. Coming to preoperative medications, if the patients have chronic non infectious uveitis, usually they will be on immunosuppressive. So continue the immunosuppressive. Steroids, the proper dosaging in the pre and postoperative period is very important, and if needed, it can be added in the intraoperative period also. Patients with uh, viral uveitis, antiviral treatment has to be restarted three weeks before surgery and has to be continued postoperatively. Counseling. If done properly, the postoperative complications can be reduced. Explain to them regarding the prolonged duration of surgery. Explain, explain to them that the postoperative visual outcome may be delayed or may be poor. Again, the chances of high postoperative 
recurrences it has to be explained complaints to the medication has to be told to the patients last but not least is loss of accommodation that too in young patients like fuchs uh, uveitis and cataract if you don't tell them that there may be loss of accommodation and if they cannot see their mobile post operatively they are not going to be very happy with you studies have said hydrophobic acrylic iol is biocompatible with this patient and the chance of pco and uh, post-op inflammation is less so with this introduction we will have a small video clip regarding the intraoperative management it starts with pupil management so most of our patients have posterior sinecae introducing a cyclospatula usually 180 degree opposite to the sinecae it breaks the addition between the anterior lens capsule and the iris so if your pupil is still small, you can introduce two Kuglans hooks, introduce 180 degree apart using a pull push technique, stress the pupil in the horizontal and vertical median. So your pupil will be now adequate. If it is still not adequate, or you have a thin and atrophic iris where your uh, stretching can cause ripping of the iris, you can go for self-retaining iris hooks. So deepen your AC well to prevent trauma to the anterior lens capsule. Usually, we use four iris hooks, which is introduced in a diamond pattern. They are introduced through sub one millimeter paracentesis ports. So, iris hooks are introduced. If needed, you can introduce even one more uh, iris hooks through your clear corneal uh, wound to prevent iris prolapse while entering and exiting the main tunnel. So, after introducing the iris hooks, we can go ahead with the capsule management. Here they are introducing one through the clear corneal incision too. So next comes the capsule management. So the main aim in capsule management is getting a five millimeter capsule to prevent post-operative post phimosis. So deepen your anterior chamber with the OVD, stain your ALC very well. We use a shear technique to prevent damage to the zonules. So we aim for five millimeter capsule. We start with the cystitone. We can go ahead and do double or even a triple rexis to reach your aim. It can be extended using a rexis forceps. Here, after debulking the nucleus, we have again gone ahead with the extension using a capsule forceps. If you want, you can do this as a last procedure after pacing the IOL also. So usually our cataracts are soft. So you can keep your uh, FACO settings and the parameters low. But if your cataract is dense, it's a senile mature cataract or a senile IMC, dense IMC in a uveitic patient, you can keep your settings accordingly. Your vertical chop is better because you can visualize your instruments all throughout the surgery. Wash your visco very well. Deepen your anterior chamber and place it in the bag IOL. In the bag IOL is the rule because the haptic may irritate the iris if left in sulcus and cause recurrent post-operative inflammation. Do a proper uh, PC polishing and ALC polishing form your AC well. If needed, you can even give subconjunctival decadron in these patients. Look for early and post-operative uh, post complication. The patients have excessive post-operative inflammation if uh, not properly taken care of, which may lead to posterior sinecae, IOL capture, increase or decreased IOP. These patients have higher chance of cystoid macular edema. Usually, diflopredinate with NSAIDs do help, but if needed, you can go, off, go for Periocular or intravitreal steroids. A late complications. Uh, PCO is very high in these patients, but still delay ND cap for six months because the chance of retinal tear is again high. If you have gone for a good rexis, capsular phimosis is poor, but if there is cocooning, you can go for relaxation, radial incisions. When properly taken care, you will usually get a good post-operative outcome. So the take-home message is a period of documented quiescence before surgery, Appropriate usage of proper dosage of perioperative steroids. Avoid topical anesthesia because you may have a lot of uh, uh, intraoperative uh, surgical complications. So it's better to take them under a uh, local anesthesia. In the bag, monofocal IOL is the rule. Expect the unexpected. Surgery is not the end of story. Always look proactively for post-op complications and treat them effectively. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Veda, for such a wonderful talk and a very, very interesting talk covering all aspects of uh, uveitic cataracts. Um, Thank you. Um, 
Yeah, um, I have a question uh, for Dr. Veda. Uh, in patients with fuchs, where we generally do not see much of a, you know, in, it's not a significant inflammation post-operatively. Do you put these patients on preoperative steroid cover as well? Usually for a week, not more than that. Uh, you, okay. Though uh, they have a long-standing cataract, they come to us in a last, last stage when they have a mature cataract and they are always in a rush. Even if we want to wait for uh, two, three weeks, they are not very happy with it. So usually it's for a week. We cannot see the posterior segment. When we do ultrasound, it shows moderate echo. So just, uh, no, yes, we do know that this oral steroids is not to help with the vitreous uh, echoes, but as a routine, we wait for a week or uh, 10 days before planning. It's not like we, we wait for a longer time. We operate yearly than rest of the patients. But we do about, add oral steroids. How about antivirals? So in patients who have had a history of zoster-related uveitis or keratouveitis, do you put these patients on uh, either local or systemic antiviral cover when you are, because these patients tend to be on topical steroids for a long time. So what is your take on this? We do add oral uh, antivirals at least three weeks before surgery and continue it for uh, six weeks uh, or at least like six months. It depends how was the previous, like if they had a uh, uh, lot of recurrences in the past, we continue it for six months, at least in maintenance groups, like one tablet of uh, uh, varicyclovir. Uh, but at least uh, three weeks before surgery and uh, up to six weeks post-surgery, we put them on oral antivirals. Thank you so much. Dr. For JE associated uveitis, what will be your preferred technique? It's, uh, it's usually the pediatric uh, consultant who operates the patient. There is always a fight between us and them. We say like wait for a few more months. Like they will like they'll be like we want to operate. We can't wait for long. But finally, we reach. Uh, uh, we also want a good uh, control of inflammation because postoperatively these children are more prone because in their pediatric age, they give a lot of uh, inflammatory reaction postoperatively. So we wait for three months of quiescence here. Uh, but in between, they do get recurrences and most of these patients are under rheumatologist care. It's not like they are under our care alone. So we have to uh, consult with them and hike up their doses before surgery so that we get a good three months of quiescence before operating on these children. And again, the chance of amblyopia and post-op inflammation is very severe and the parents' expectations are very high. They expect a lot and... And every time when they come and we say inflammation is there, we'll wait for some more time. It also becomes an uh, issue. But we do wait for three months because postoperatively, the chance of developing a membrane is again high. And again, putting the child under GA, going for a membraneectomy is going to be a very tedious procedure. So wait well before surgery for inflammation control. I think it was such a lovely talk that, you know, probably I'd like to highlight the important uh, aspects what she had mentioned. I think it's very essential for that pre-operative and post-operative immunomodulatory cover. And they have to be, it doesn't end with just one year. It is like for quite some time, yes. especially in children. And uh, unfortunately, that's not the case. And um, I think that point has to be taken very, very well in, in patients, especially pediatric uveitis, as what you had mentioned, and counseling for good immunomodulation compliance is very, very uh, other thing is in uh, at least in our setup what patient thinks is once they go undergo surgery the treatment is over exactly. that's what they think they don't think that surgery is for cataract they think it is the treatment of uveitis after that they can be free of all medications so it has to be explained in detail that they have to continue their medications even after surgery yeah very very uh, very true and very valid thank you so much dr veda thank you thank you so we will move on with the next talk. Uh, other keynote speaker is Dr. Karpagam Damodaran, and her talk will be on intravitreals and uveitis. Okay. A very good morning. This is Dr. Karpagam Damodaran, uveitis specialist and cataract surgeon with Dr. Raval Zai Hospital, Chennai. At the outset, I would like to thank Karnataka Academic Society, Dr. Kilan Kumaran, sir, and Dr. Sudarshan, sir, for this great opportunity. My talk today would be on intravitreals in uveitis. So, uh, the prevalence of uveitis ranges between 38 to 714 cases, and it is responsible for almost 10 to 15% of all the blindness. 
Posterior uveitis, including vitreous inflammation, is one of the major causes of visual morbidity among patients with uveitis. And if you analyze the causes of visual loss, secondary to macular edema seems to be predominating the list of causes, amounting up to 40%, followed by choroidal neovascularization, glaucoma, optic nerve involvement, vitreous opacification, and cataract formation. Now, if you further analyze the cause of uveitic macular edema, this is the most common structural complication, almost causing visual morbidity in up to 40% of the patients. The pathophysiology of macular edema has not been fully understood, and the most important cause is attributed to the dysfunction of the blood retinal barrier. Now, the advantage of the intravitreal glue is that it allows a relatively lower dose of the duct to be administered while achieving a higher concentration in the target areas, and the most important is to avoid the side effects which have been associated with the systemic use of the drug. The disadvantages of an intravitreal injection include local side effects like cataract, glaucoma, sterile and infectious endophthalmitis, hypotony, intravitreal hemorrhage, and retinal detachment. However, the incidence of these complications are relatively low. Now, if you go about classifying the use of intravitreal uh, agents, we can broadly divide them into uh, immunomodulators, which kind of covers the spectrum of the steroids, immunosuppressives, and biologicals. We have the anti vegips the NSAIDs, and the antibiotics. So moving on to intravitreal steroids, corticosteroids are the cornerstone of treatment in non-infectious uveitis. Systemic corticosteroids have always been known to have severe adverse effects in the form of hyperglycemia, hypertension, fluid retention, GI ulceration, osteoporosis, and a higher susceptibility to infections associated with psychological problems as well. So in this aspect, localized corticosteroids seems to be a preferred choice of treatment. So we started off with having intravitreal triamcinone acetin, which has a mean half-life about 18.6 days, and it can be given as a single dose in a dosage of 4 mg in 0.1 ml. And an improvement of the visual activity can be seen in about 50 to 70% of the patients. The advantages being the low cost and the disadvantages, however, being repeated injections, which are required to maintain the effect over a period of time. Intravitreal dexamethasone was the next in line, this is basically a water-soluble synthetic glucocorticoid, which is three times more potent when compared to triamcinone acetate. Being a small molecule, it is rapidly cleared from the vitreous with a half-life of about 5.5 hours. And the newer sustained release intravitreal dexamethasone to release corticosteroids over prolonged duration of time in small doses. It's biodegradable and is a sustained release rod-shaped implant, which has been approved by the US FDA. This basically eludes 700 microgram of the drug, is placed in the vitreous cavity, and it eludes the drug over a six month period. It comes with a preloaded applicator with a 22 gauge needle that is inserted in the eye via the fast planar approach. The chronic uveitis evaluation of the intravitreal dexamethasone implant, the Huron study, was a randomized phase three study which evaluated the dexamethasone implant in eyes with non infectious intermediate or posterior uveitis. And the eligible eyes were divided into three groups to receive intravitreal uh, dexamethasone implant in uh, 0.7 microgram, 0.35 microgram, or has sham. Now, the primary outcome was a reduction in the vitreous haze at eight weeks, which was met significantly more in eyes treated with intravitreal dexamethasone implant when compared to 12% in the sham group. The ocular hypertension, which was an adverse effect, uh, especially when IOP was more than 25 millimeter of mercury, was observed in 7 to 8% of the patients. In fake eyes, cataract progression was found to be somewhere around 12 to 15 percent, compared to 7 percent of the eyes in the sham group. Now, the Safodex study also showed that the raised IOP is noted at two months, and how well it seems to be only transient. It's well tolerated in the pediatric uveitic eyes and when used bilaterally. The next in line is the intravitreal fluosinol acetonide, which is 124th hash soluble as a dexamethylone implant with an increased half-life. Now, Retisert um, is a non-biodegradable sustained release device, which is available in two doses of uh, 0.59 milligram and 2.1 milligram. It's approved by the US FDA for the treatment of chronic non-infectious uveitis, and uh, this came around in 2005. It's basically measures 3 into 2 into 5 millimeter and consists of a 1.5 millimeter central drug pellet. It has to be surgically placed through the past plan incision with a 20 gauge needle. Uh, and extending 3 to 3.5 millimeters circumferentially, 4 millimeter posterior and parallel to the rimbus. The MUST uh, trial, which is basically a phase three randomized control trial, was conducted to study the relative effectiveness and the safety of uh, fluosinol and astronaut implant against the systemic corticosteroids and immunosuppressives in uh, 255 patients. 
So it was observed that there was no statistical significance between the two groups with regard to the proportion of the eye showing resolution of CME. However, the risk of adverse events were higher in the implant group with 77.9% requiring IOP lowering medications against 34% of those in the systemic therapy group after 54 weeks and nearly fourfold incidence of cataract surgery in the implant group. Illumin implant is a non biodegradable intravitreal implant which contains fluosmone and astronide with a cylindrical tube containing a central drug uh, polymer matrix which releases about 0.19 milligram of fluosmone and astronide into the vitreous cavity. A twin system is, can be used uh, to inject the drug in office based setting, which uh, practically eliminates uh, you know, the need of a surgical uh, intervention. It releases a low drug at a lower dose, 0 0.2 to 0 0.5 microgram per day for 18 to 16 months, and it's been FDA approved for the treatment of diabetic macular edema. There has been off-label use in patients with macular edema secondary to non-infectious uveitis, and an increase in IOP development and progression of cataract, spontaneous dislocation or uh, dissociation of the pellet from the support strut, hypotony, and cytomegalo endothelitis are few of the adverse events which have been associated with the lumen. The, it may have a potential role in the future for the treatment of uveitic macular edema. Ivation is another new drug. It's a helical sustained release implant which contains about uh, 0.900 microgram of triamcinone astronide and it eludes drug for about uh, two years. It measures four millimeter, it me measures around a 0.4 millimeter long along by 0.2 millimeter wide and is implanted through the plant's planar sclerotomy, less than 0.5 millimeter in the diameter. The helical shape is designed to increase the surface area and is available for drug diffusion and anchor the device to sclera, while the flat cap is uh, meant to sit behind the conjecture. So this is the flat cap and this is the helical structure. The phase 2B trials have been terminated, uh, however, and no further clinical uh, trials have been uh, completed with this regard. This is a comparison of uh, studies for uh, personal astronite, uh, which was uh, came about in um, ophthalmologies. Coming to intravitreal immunosuppressives, intravitreal methotrexate is basically an antimetabolite which competitively inhibits enzyme dihydrofluoride reductase, and it also inhibits the production of tetrahydrofluorate, which in turn inhibits the formation of thymidate, thus resulting in an inhibition of DNA replication and RNA transcription. So it can be injected in a dose of 400 microgram in 0.1 ml, and one case of thonal epitheliopathy, which was managed symptomatically, has been reported. Topical folinic acid can be used to treat the corneal decompensation. Intravitreal serolimus, uh, rapamycin, which is basically a macroid antibiotic. Now, it interrupts the inflammatory cascade by inhibiting the expression of uh, interleukin 2, 4, 15, which in turn suppresses the T cell activation and proliferation. The SAFE trial in 2003 was an initial study which was conducted in 30 patients to evaluate the efficacy of intravitreal and subconjunctival serolimus. They saved two study compared the effect of 880 microgram of intravitreal serolimus as against the 440 microgram, and it was administered every two months. The study was initiated in 2015. The Sakura study was a multi-center randomized study which was uh, uh, done to evaluate the efficacy and the tolerability of three doses of serolimus, 44, 480, and 880. Now, the 440 microgram of serolimus demonstrated a significant control. So it's well tolerated and effective in controlling active UVID inflammation in the eye but there was no significant improvement in the best corrected visual activity or the central macular thickness. We have the role of intravitreal biologicals, the TNF-alpha inhibitors like etanercept, infliximab, and adalimumab. Now, intravitreal injections of etanercept may not be useful in the management of ocular diseases, and it was found that intravitreal injections of infliximab may potentially be really related to severe intraocular inflammation. Injections of infliximab may benefit the cases of uh, persistent non-infectious posterior uveitis, and refractory you know, pseudopagic uh, cystoid macular edema. A combination of adalimumab and bevacizumab may be effective in the management of cases with partially responsive neovascular AMD and macular edema. And there was no clinical uh, experience with uh, or uh, evidence with intravitreal golimumab or sertolizumab, and they have yet to be published. So coming to the role of intravitreal infliximumab, it's a biological agent and a chimeric monoclonal antibody against the tumor necrosis factor has a prolonged half-life of up to 9.5 days. 100 milligram of the lifelace powder, which is reconstituted in 10 ml of sterile water, and is administered as a dose of 5 to 10 milligram per kg IV infusion. And the dose is 1 milligram in 0.05 ml. Uh, it can be given in first day at two weeks and at six weeks. 
infusions can be repeated in cases of relapses or remission. Uh, methotrexate, uh, 7.5 mg weekly and folic acid, 5 mg daily. Can be the so, a uh, prospective trial of infliximab for refractive uveitis was uh, published way back in uh, 2005 in the of uh, ophthalmology and it was noted a uh, 78% success rate. I had uh, severe uh, adverse events like uh, embolus, congestive heart failure, lupus like reaction, and vitreous uh, hemorrhage. And the, um, there has also been a report of infliximab in the treatment of uveitis, which has been resistant to the combination of azathioprine, cyclosporine, and steroid corticosteroids in the cases of uh, bear shields disease. So, um, can be used uh, in suckers, like, you know, the attacks with the uh, recurrent uh, uveitic attacks and has a corticoid. Uh, Corticosteroid sparing effect has such. Now, anti VEGFs, aqueous anti uh, VEGF concentration is significantly higher in patients with uveitic uh, CME and than those with uh, 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 cystoid macular edema. So, chronic intraocular inflammation leads to an increased production of inflammatory cytokines, such as interleukin beta and interleukin C, which reduce the VEGF production by mu cells. And this in turn disrupts the inner and outer uh, blood retinal barrier. And increase the vascular permeability through the protein kinase C isomone cascade, leading to subsequent macular edema. So, bevacizumab and ranibizumab have been tried. There is a limited potency and the effect is short lived, necessitating further uh, frequent re injections. Furthermore, they are associated with the theoretical risk of systemic uh, adverse events such as thromboembolic phenomena. Now, a significantly lower rate of cataract progression or a rise in IOC can be seen sugar in supplementary therapy. It can be an supplementary therapy in patients with. Persistent uveitic macular edema, particularly in eyes with Peggy Kais and in steroid responders. So, uh, there has been a report of uh, bevacizumab for uh, uh, uveitic uh, macular uh, edema. And uh, coming to intravitreal NSAIDs, diclofenac can be used and it is given in a single dose of 500 microgram and it has a low theoretical risk of increasing IOP. However, it has a shorter half-life and in the vitreosuma when compared to the uh, uh, steroids and can be more considered in, in terms of an adjective treatment. Intravitreal GAN cyclovir, this was the first implantable uh, device which is probably advocated for clinical use. It's a non-biodegradable polymer containing GAN cyclovir which are cert and especially used in the treatment of um, uh, AIDS-related uh, cytomegalovirus retinitis. So 405 microgram, milligram of cancer and 0.25% of magnesium steroid. The drug is released at the rate of one uh, microgram per hour that lasts for close to five to eight. But uh, the more recent studies have suggested that there's um, the highly active uh, retroviral therapy, cancer clover implant is less effective than the systemic therapy in improving uh, survival and decreasing the dissemination. So it can be given in uh, the induction phase where you require six injections uh, up to 2 mm and 0.1 ml over three weeks and the maintenance phase of uh, single weekly injections. The disadvantage is being it does not confer protection to the fellow eye or the other organs and may be overcome by the concomitant use of oral gland cyclovir. So the other adverse events are uh, end of RD, cataract and uh, vitreous hemorrhage. Intravitreal clindamycins have also been tried and one milligram of clindamycin in 0.1 ml and uh, combined with one milligram of dexamethasone in 0.1 ml. So uh, the advantage is being it's more convenient, safe, uh, uh, having a safer systemic uh, side effect profile and uh, there is a greater uh, bioavailability of the drug and a few follow-up visits are required even the hematological uh, uh, evaluations uh, tend to drop down. The disadvantage is being the multiple injections, thereby increasing the risk of uh, complications. Then, the, basically, the side effects of all the oral drugs in uh, ocular tox toxoplasmosis, like azithromycin, is used for GI, causes a lot of GI disturbances. And we have skin rashes associated with tendamycin, pyrimethamine leads on to a lot of nausea and vomiting, and azithro can also lead on to leukopenia and thrombocytopenia. So, in, when you want to overcome these kind of systemic side effects, I think you can choose to go for an intravitreal clindamycin. So these are the studies. And there is also a study of a 39-year-old retropositive with uh, signs of uh, toxoplasmic retinocarditis. And uh, this was one of the first case report with the uh, intravitreal implant of uh, Linda with uh, DEXA. So intravitreal therapy is becoming uh, slowly the preferred choice of treatment in, for the majority of the ocular diseases, uh, in, for especially the non-infectious uveitis due to its efficacy and a better safety profile especially in patients with unilateral disease and without any systemic component. 
Now, the drawback being there is a necessity to treat both the eyes separately in case of bilateral uveitis, and there is a need for more frequent follow ups and absence of systemic benefits in patients with extraocular manifestations. I have not discussed about the intravitreal use of antibiotics for certain conditions because the scope is, uh, you know, it, it's a much uh, bigger topic and I don't think uh, the time will permit the discussion. So uh, thank you, uh, Kavos, for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Kapakam, for the excellent talk and the overview of intravitreal injection, which commonly we use in our practice. Now this talk is open for the discussion. I would like to get comments from the other panelists. Dr. Vinay, Dr. Apurva, you would like to give any comments? Especially the things like toxoplasmosis when you're using a clindamycin with the dexamethasone. You would like to get your experience on that? Same, madam. Yes, Dr. Manjula, would you like to? Yeah, yeah I had a patient with uh, recurrent toxoretinochoroiditis. I had almost like the patient was treated elsewhere with Pactrim Dia so many times. I gave him clindam. I don't, uh, I don't know. I want your opinions. I don't give dexamethasone. I usually give only clindamycin. It has given me good results, only intravitreal clindamycin. Is it advisable to give dexamethasone also, madam, in these patients when you don't know? Especially if the vision threatening, the vision is in the closer to the phobia, the retinitis, we want to reduce the inflammation. In an immunocompetent individual, we do combine both. I have given only clindamycin managed with uh, systemic steroids. Uh, clinda alone, we give it in a case of immunocompromised cases. In an immunocompetent, we prefer to combine both. Yes. Shall we move on, Padma, to the next? Yes. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, we thank Dr. Karpakam and also the all the uh, keynote speaker, Dr. Marina, for excellent presentations and the lecture by UVT Cataract by Dr. Vedanakin, intravitreal speak Dr. Karpakam. Now we'll move on to the second part of the session too, which is most interesting and most awaited, awaited one. In this, I request Dr. Apurva to present an interesting case series that is multifocal choroiditis different strokes. Over to Dr. Apurva. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, may I request you to please play my video? Yes. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to present in this UVA session at COSCOM 2021. Today, I'll be presenting a case series of choroiditis. Uh, case Could one you please raise the volume, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Karthik? Redness and diminished vision in both eyes since three days. There was no known systemic illness, no history of fever. Vision in the right eye was 2 by 60 and left eye was 6 by 24. Anterior segment in both the eyes was normal. The right eye fundus showed the subretinal fluid pockets that you can see very clearly. And the left eye fundus showed uh, again SRF pockets with a little disc edema. There was a large subretinal fluid pocket or a neurosensory detachment involving the macula in both the eyes. Both eyes showed a basilary layer detachment, turbid fluid and dislobulation of the outer retina. The FFA of the right eye showed hypo in the early frames. The ICGA was interesting in that there were numerous dark dots all over the posterior pole and beyond the arcades as well. The FFA in the right eye at one minute began to show some pinpoint hypofluorescence and the hypofluorescent dark dots remained hypo in the late frames. The pinpoint leaks was pooling in the subretinal fluid pockets. As we can see, there, these HDDs or hypofluorescent dark dots continue to persist. Uh, and uh, a few of them have become isofluorescent as well. 
coming to the left eye again there was pinpoint hyperfluorescences on the fa yeah yeah and a few uh, LEDs, uh, all over the fundus in the icga we can see that some of them are becoming ISO. Uh, these are the HDDs that we can see. And it is shown clearly that it is all over the fundus. Did the usual UVI test workup that we do okay. and uh, everything was non-contributory. Okay. Okay. She was started on one milligram per kg steroids. At the end of one month itself, the vision uh, was restored to almost normal in the right eye and 6 well in the left eye. You the fluid had completely dissolved. He is a 50 year old man and his right eye diminished vision since two days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This was the first presentation of this patient to us. Yeah. In the right so, eye, the yeah, vision yeah, more was more experienced now. And the left eye was 6 by 9. There was history of second dose of COVID vaccine three weeks prior to this presentation. He was a known diabetic hypertensive since 15 years. At this visit, he was diagnosed as a right eye optic neuritis and treated with oral steroids. On the subsequent follow-up, he was symptomatically better with right eye vision 612. Presented a couple of months later with diminished vision in the left eye this time for just one day. The right eye vision was 66 and the left eye vision was 624. Anterior segment was normal. Right eye looked normal and the left eye showed the subretinal fluid pockets with a few choroiditis lesions in the posterior view. Coming to the FA ICG, FA that there is some early hypo corresponding to the choroiditis lesions. And on the ICGA, there are these hypofluorescent lesions over the posterior pole. And they continue to remain hypofluorescent. There is hyper in the late frames and late pooling in the last frames with disc leakage. The right eye, which looked normal, also showed these dark areas within the arcades. Also started on oral steroids and uh, the, uh, the, the investigation, the blood investigations were non-contributory. At four week follow-up itself on oral steroids, the vision was restored to six by six. Now coming to the third case, uh, this 51 year old woman came with sudden diminished vision in the right eye more than the left eye. Right eye was uh, counting finger close to face. There was a large neurosensory detachment, RP choroid undulation. FA in the right eye showed uh, these hypo areas as seen in the second case, even up to half discamic lesions. These continued to remain hypofluorescent and the hypo areas on the FA showed leakage in the late frames along with disc leakage. The investigations were non-contributory. This patient also was started on oral steroids and after six weeks of treatment, there was marked. However, at eight weeks, at about 10 mg uh, oral steroids, there was recurrence in both the eyes with the appearance of disc edema and neurosensory detachments. This time, along with steroids, azathioprine was also started. Now, uh, eventually, after nine months of azathioprine use and tapering, it was stopped. And uh, after stopping, she came back to us uh, for two months of follow-up, uh, at which she was uh, doing very well. So here, uh, I have tried to present three cases of choroiditis, all three with multiple neurosensory detachments. Uh, two cases had early hypofluorescence and one case had early pinpoint hyperfluorescence. All three cases obviously showed late leaking and pooling in the NSDs. ICGA were a little different between the cases. The first case showed hypofluorescent dark dots, which were very uh, numerous, circumscribed, round, and uh, distributed evenly throughout the fundus. And some of them became isofluorescent in the later frames. The second and third case showed hypofluorescent lesions, which were clustered around the posterior pole and just maybe beyond the arcades. They were larger in size compared to the dots that were seen in the first case. They were uh, irregularly shaped and uh, they were randomly distributed and not regularly distributed. 
all the three cases were managed with oral steroids. My question is, uh, the first case was uh, probably a stromal choroiditis because of the uh, distribution of the HDDs. And case two and three were choriocapillaritis owing to these hypofluorescent uh, lesions that were uh, geographic in nature. My question is, is this distinction really necessary for management? And is ICGA the only modality for differentiation between these two entities? I would like the panel to elaborate on these points. Thank you, Dr. Apova, for the excellent case series on white dots, like different types, like, you know, you managed it very well, three cases in seven minutes, uh, very well documented and very well presented. I should congratulate you for this. And coming to the discussion, uh, your first, uh, first case, we'll take case by case by. First case is a stomal choroiditis. It is a case, classical case of a BKH disease, where you had yearly multiple hyperfluorescence with increasing in hyperfluorescence with pooling of the dye as FFA as a characteristic feature of BKH. And ICG showed multiple hyperfluorescent dark darts distributed extensively over the fundus. This is classical uh, BKH. The second case, what you showed is post-vaccination, which I would like to highlight. Within that, the patient has developed a choroiditis in the right eye and then subsequently in the left eye. Here, the lesions are located in the posterior port. Early IPO with late hyperfluorescence is a characteristic FFA finding. We get it in choroiditis. So here, like, you know, the, what there are case reports have been reported, multifocal choroiditis, APM, PPE, kind of a picture following vaccination. Your case is very well fitting into um, APM, PPE kind of a picture, asymmetrical and uh, bilateral involvement only the posterior pole involvement and good response to steroids with short-term good visual acuity, acuity you have noted. Coming to a third case, it started initially as uh, multifocal irregular lesions with a serous elevation, uh, the classically fitting into multifocal colitis. And during the recurrence, it had bilateral lesions with a disc edema. This time, it's a combination of like, you know, uh, fitting into multifocal choroiditis, and if you've done the ICG, maybe we can able to differentiate between the stomal. But now, whether I, uh, important to differentiate between primary stomal choroiditis and choriocapillaritis, yes, it is important. One, to make the exact diagnosis. Second, to know the course of the disease and to plan the further management especially things like stomal choroiditis is going to take long time. The activity is going to persist. There, your ICG is going to tell you whether the patient has active lesions. Visual, visual, as in your case, visual activity will be 6-6. Uh, retina is flat. It may look normal and the OCT is flat. But when you do an ICG, you will be seeing hyperfluorescent spots on the choroid, suggestive of subclinical choroidal inflammation, where we try to take these patients with systemic immunosuppressive therapy for longer duration of time. Second, coming to choriocapillaritis, here again, we need to differentiate whether it is a primary photoreceptoritis or now they call it as a secondary photoreceptoritis. The secondary ones they call is because of the increased ischemia as seen in your case, there is an extensive involvement of the choriocapillaries, ischemia, secondary RP involvement, manifesting in the form of choroidal inflammation as in the second case and the third case. Here, um, ICG help us to find out the extent may not be there, but in this case, we use autofluorescence to monitor the response to treatment. Ma'am, mm. Ma at the level of the choriocapillaris, how will AF help, ma'am, unless there is uh, RP atrophy? Uh, the AF may not see this is a secondary involvement. Most of the patients, what happens is ICG help us to find out the extent, and ICG mm -hmm. we will not be able to do it every time in follow up of these cases. These cases, in addition to the choriocapillary involvement, they have a secondary RP involvement. For example, if you take multifocal choroiditis in your second case, or if you have a choroiditis, multifocal choroiditis or serpiginous like choroiditis, they have a combination of choriocapillaries with RPE involvement. In that situation, autofluorescence helps us to assess the activity. 
Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And especially in SLC TB, I mean, chorea capillaris. Opta is useful to study the yes. chorea capillaris morphology and the involvement and to titrate the treatment. Now people have come out with various imaging software to detect the. Uh, Study the chorea capillary layer itself separately to study the disease course, where they have automated algorithms to map out the areas of chorea capillary non-perfusion to monitor the response to treatment. In that situation, for your chorea capillary, chorea capillaritis, OCTA may be a useful tool to study the disease course, but they are all evolving technology that needs to be standardized in different disease entities. Mm. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes. I think uh, I find it. Add one yes. point to what? See, basically, imaging aids. Ultimately, you will need to treat the what it is. So VKH or see the vaccine induced again, as what Dr. Padma said. I mean, it could be APMPP. It could be an underlying TB which could have reactivated also. So I think <laughs> one needs to rule out everything. And also, along with that, the autofluorescence, as she said, makes a huge difference, especially with APMPP. You can definitely see a lot more lesions than what you're seeing clinically. Uh, and they have a very characteristic finding and collaborated with the OCTA, it would be very helpful. VKH, anything with disc involvement, it's always something which requires treatment. So I think more than the imaging that adds on, but I think you should need to treat the patient as a whole, you know, in terms of with all the symptoms. Multifocal choroiditis is just a sign. And uh, one needs to keep a watch on, you know, what exactly. So we can even for one year, the treatment which I which you have given and tapering quickly. I think I'll be a little concerned because these cases will need medication for a much longer period of time. Mm. I agree so, uh, with the line of management. The second case, steroids will do. Coming to the third case, you have treated with steroids and azathioprine. If there is no activity, if your coronal lesion is quiet and the patient is doing well, you can, like, you know, stop the treatment in a case of a coronavirus, but you just assess it. Whereas the first case will need long term immunosuppressive therapy. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So, uh, one question, ma'am. Uh, APNPP classically they describe as uh, transient, it heals yes. without any. Layout. But somehow, uh, in my very limited experience, I have seen that what looks like APMPP at the first visit, sometimes it's unilateral, it is fleeting, it goes away in a couple of weeks, but the patient comes back with the same eye recurrence or bilateral recurrence. So is it mm -hmm. something like I read somewhere that in Asia, maybe the APMPP course is a little different? Yes. <laughs> Yes, Thank like you said, APMPP, whenever you get a patient with APMPP, either you can observe or put the patient on steroids. Steroids helps for a faster resolution. These people, you have to keep it under close observation. When you observe these people, over a period of time, six months, they get converted into serpiginous like choroiditis or ambiguous choroiditis in our set of population, which means first set may go away. The subsequent visits need steroids and other medications. They need a closer follow-up. Ma'am, even the, if the TB workup is negative, is it like the spectrum is unrelated to TB or it's it's something the, the disease etiology only, I mean, the disease progression only is like that? Is it like we are missing some underlying tubercular etiology in those cases of APMPP which are progressing to ampigenous? I think once you see is an evolving disease and they may have underlying tuberculous etiology, like APMPP is a multifactorial cause, could be triggered by any viral infection, and then subsequent during the course, the TB can get reactivated. If hmm. not in all cases, but majority of the cases when they develop into ampigenous or serpigenous like choroiditis, then we have to watch out for tuberculosis. Okay. If they evolve over a period of time, they need close follow up, especially when they have a recurrences. You may convert them from APM PPE to subgenus like choroiditis category. Yes. I think we will move on to the next. Thank you, Dr. Apurva, for, sir, for an interesting case series. Uh, we will move on to the next presentation. Uh, and this is by Dr. Namita Dave. Uh, Dr. Namita is a consultant at uh, Narayan Etralia, Bangalore. Uh, can we have her presentation, please? <coughs> No. Yes, 
Dr. Namita has not shared the video. So is Dr. Namita is here on the panel. So is she going to go live? Yeah, yeah. I have shared it. But if you want, I can present it as well. Uh, Mr. Karthik, could you find her Ma video? I couldn't find her video. So if your presentation present is ready, can you... Yeah, yeah, I live? can present it. Yeah, yeah, I can do that. I can present okay. it. Do you want a few seconds? I'll uh, just take a few look. seconds because I wasn't prepared to present. So can I ask uh, the next speaker to go on and by then if yes. you can look at the file and sure. then we can do this. We can do that. Yes. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. absolutely. So uh, we will move on to the next talk by Dr. Dwani Shah. And Dr. Dwani is a vitreoretinal and uvia consultant at Prabhai Clinic and Research Center, Bangalore. Uh, can we welcome Dr. Dwani? Can we have her uh, video, please? Good morning, everyone. Thank you, QOS, for giving me this opportunity to present in this forum. I'll just share my screen now. So I would like to present a case which highlights the importance of multimodal imaging for correct diagnosis and treatment in choroiditis. Before I begin, I would like to thank my fellow Dr. Shatabdi Nanda, my mentors, Dr. Kalpana and Dr. Krishna, and our pulmonologist, Dr. Suma. So this is a case of a 39 years old lady who came to us for a second opinion for blurring of vision in the right eye. She was diagnosed as multifocal choroiditis elsewhere and was already on Visalone 10 milligrams. This Visalone was started three months back in a tapering schedule. She had a history of tuberculosis in her mother and child. On presentation in July 2021 to us, her best corrected visual acuity in the right eye was 66 parts but blurred. The anterior segment shows AC cells 1 plus. The posterior segment shows vitreous cells 1 plus with serpiginous like choroiditis involving the posterior pole. The IOP was normal. Left eye examination was completely normal. So we did review her old records, which showed that CBC, ASR, MON2, CRP, serum ACE were normal. The TPHA and the TOXO, IgG and IgM were negative. The RA factor was negative. The chest X-ray was normal. The March 2021 photograph showed that there was an inferonasal choroiditis patch and a minimal macular edema. The May 2021 photograph showed a new choroiditis lesion superior to the phobia and resolved macular edema. When she presented to us in July uh, 2021, uh, as compared to her photographs, uh, there were new choroiditis lesions in the posterior pole. In the autofluorescence, we can see that there are areas of hyper autofluorescence indicating activity. OCT through multiple lesions were done, where we can see that in the uh, second photograph, there's a double layer sign which shows increased uh, activity. And in the third photograph, we can see that there is a hyperreflective uh, area suggestive of a CNVM with a subretinal fluid. We did an FFA and an ICG. Uh, so the FFA showed uh, uh, choroidal, uh, choroiditis lesions uh, with activity and uh, there were areas of uh, peripheral minimal vascular leakage. Also, if you see the posterior pole, there is as we can see that the CNVM, which is uh, small and uh, less hyperfluorescent, increases in area and intensity through the middle and the late phases. The ICGA shows a uh, hypocyanosin spots, which uh, remains hypo. Uh, till the middle and the late phases. Uh, so uh, the OCTA also captures the CNVM membrane, the network beautifully. Now, uh, since there was an increase, uh, increased activity uh, of the choroiditis, we did repeat a few investigations to understand where we stand. So uh, we did the CBC, which showed an increased uh, total WBC count. The ESR was 18. HIV, VDRL, TPHA, TOGSO were negative. The FBS, RFT, and LFT were normal. Serum ACE was normal. Montu was normal. Quantiferon TB gold test was negative. The HRCT showed enlarged sub sentiment ring lymph nodes. Rest of the parenchyma was normal. So the diagnosis was presumed ocular TB with secondary inflammatory CNVM. So uh, she was started on ATT along with the, with the consultation of our pulmonologist. The oral steroids were increased to 40 milligrams and a tapering schedule was given. Right eye was injected with intravitreal ranibizumab. 
A month later, when we followed up with uh, all the imaging, uh, we did see that uh, the choroiditis lesions were resolving and the CNVM also was regressing with a decrease in the IRF and the SRF. And the OCTA also sh is showing a regressing membrane. If I have to show you a comparison of the uh, July photograph to the August photograph of the autofluorescence, we can see that the area marked in the circle, blue circle, is showing a new lesion on the autofluorescence. Uh, due to this new lesion, we increase the oral steroids to 30 milligram. The intravitreal ranibizumab was repeated in view of the CNBM. The next month follow-up showed regressing lesions, regressing CNVM, also confirmed on the OCTA. So the oral steroids also were to taper. In the October follow-up, we do see that the CNVM has regressed beautifully with minimal cystoid spaces uh, juxtaphobially. The autofluorescence is showing regressed lesions and the OCTA is also showing regressing CNVM. So the oral uh, steroids were tapered to 15 milligrams and intravitreal ranibizumab was repeated in view of this cystoid spaces. Uh, to summarize, this is the timeline. This is the first uh, visit where we see an active membrane on the OCTA, active lesions on the autofluorescence and the o uh, OCT uh, showing a CNVM with intraretinal edema and the SRF. This is a month later where we are seeing a regressing CNVM, though a small increased lesion on the autofluorescence. Then two months later, we have a regressing CNVM, regressing choroiditis. Three months later, we are seeing that the choroiditis has healed well and there's a regressing CNVM. She's not a native of here. So uh, this was her last visit with us. There were scarred choroidal lesions, oral steroids tapered to 50 milligrams and a follow-up schedule given. Uh, she was to follow up uh, locally. Uh, in view of ethambutol toxicity, to avoid that, uh, the pulmonologist uh, change only kept her on INH and rifampicin. And we had given her a total of four intravitreal ranuzumab for the secondary CNVM. To highlight, uh, what this case shows is that the review of the old records is essential to see what investigations are done, how does the uh, I look at that visit in those visits. And uh, in our uh, examination, multimodal imaging helped to pick up the inflammatory CNVM. The autofluorescence uh, also showed an early recurrence in the second visit of the choroidal lesions. This helped in titration of the oral steroids. We increased it in, those, in that visit. Showed uh, uh, All the photographs showed good resolution and response to treatment. So it was good for us to uh, know that the treatment is working and it is good for patient education. The OCTA and the OCT showed regression of CNVM through various visits. So uh, thank you everyone for the patient uh, listening and the case is open for discussion. Thank you, Dr. Dwani, for such an interesting case. Um, I think, uh, I mean, I'll open this case for discussion. Um, uh, Dr. Padma, anybody yes. would like to thank comment you, on? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Dwani, for nicely highlighting that uh, classical case of choroiditis with the CNVM. And also your patient had a paradoxical worsening when you reduced the steroids to 30 mg and then you stepped up the case and managed it well. And many times it's a development of inflammatory CNVM is a real challenge in you in inflammatory eye. Uh, basically the clinical clues like a grayish discoloration on hemorrhages, if you're lucky, we'll get it on the fundus photograph. Whereas in your case, your case is picked up by the OCT and also the octa showed a nice vessel complex. So many times, even if the patient is healed, division is 6-6, six, six, they come back to distortion of the objects. And that imaging is important where the OCT and ACTA help us to pick up the new vessels. So very well managed. I think one more point I would like to highlight in her case, I mean, following the previous case series. So this case is actually initially started off as multifocal choroiditis. And then eventually during the course, there was a kind of an ampigenous like choroiditis pattern. So in that, I think that is a very important take home, especially when you see an ampigenous like where there is, these lesions are confluent. And this patient had a Mantu negative as well as a Quantiferon negative as well. So I think uh, the clinical phenotype itself is something significant. And now it has been shown by extensive studies which have been published that we need to keep presumed ocular TB in these cases, because the minute we said reduce it with steroids, this flares back. 
and these patients require anti tb medications of course under supervision uh, thank you so much for uh, all the input the can, can i ask a question can i ask a question Yes, yeah, ma'am. My question is: uh, When you see a recurrence with lowering of the steroids, with the investigations being normal, how do you decide? Ex yeah, correct. The phenotype is very typical, but how do you decide whether you have to with the MAN two negative? HST also sh doesn't show any lung involvement per se. Only the lymph nodes, and the quantiferon is negative. Whether you should go for immunosuppression or you should go for ATT med. I think we have enough evidence right now that this clinical evidence, this kind of a phenotype which you see is very significant, especially in a high TB endemic world. I think we should keep that on a high priority. And of course, we've had our own subset of patients who are everything negative, but they have done eventually very well with anti-tubercular med medications and they've not had recurrences. So I would probably put that and on high on my list first, unless proven otherwise it's TB. The second one is if you're seeing a lot of RPE hyperplasia and there is a lot of pigment outburst, I would still think it is tuberculosis because it's, very, I mean, the pathology is such that, you know, this comes in uh, MTB because the bug stays in the RPE. And of course, if you still have doubts, then maybe you could even look at intraocular fluid analysis as well. But uh, a clinical phenotype like this, I think uh, TB would be high on my mind. Thank you. If there are no questions, then we move on to the next presentation. That is post-vaccine ocular, ocular inflammation. Is it an incidence or coincidence by Dr. Namita Dave? She's a senior uveitis consultant at Narayan Ekrala Yattu. Uh, over to Dr. Namita. Uh, he's apparently found my uh, video. Uh, is he going to be? Yeah, yeah he can play. I'm playing, I'm playing your video. I have okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. The case that I shall pre present today is of a 60-year-old male who came with the complaints of decrease in vision in the right eye since 10 days. He had the history of cataract surgery done in the eye in early 2020. COVID vaccination, Covaxin taken a month back. No history of COVID infection or symptoms. No known systemic illness. Right eye showed a visual acuity of 636, not improving to pinhole and N18. And left eye was 69, improving to 66 and 6. The anterior segment was essentially normal in both the eyes. Vitreous showed cells in the right eye and asteroid hyalosis in the left. The retina in the left eye was essentially normal. And the right eye showed a normal disc. Multiple blood flame-shaped hemorrhages along the infer inferotemporal arcade. Vascular sheathing, superior nasally, nasally, and inferiorly with macular edema. OCT of the right eye showed serous macular detachment, cystoid macular edema with cysts present in the outer nuclear, inner nuclear, and the ganglion cell layer. There was disorganization of the inner retinal inner layers. A fundus fluorescein angiography showed staining and leakage of, from the vessel walls. Multiple areas of hypofluorescence are seen, which correspond to the retinal hemorrhages clinically, suggested by the blocked fluorescence. Involved quadrants showed extensive areas of hypofluorescence, suggestive of capillary non-perfusion. Large areas of capillary non-perfusion are also seen in the peripheral areas. Patient was investigated for vasculitis and uh, Mantus was strongly positive with 28 millimeters, ESR 30. Quantiferon TB gold was positive and HRCT was essentially normal. The pulmonologist was consulted and antitubercular therapy along with oral steroid was started. Two weeks later, the visual acuity in the right eye improved to 618 and the pressures were normal. The oral steroids and antitubercular therapy were continued. Cystoid macular edema showed minimal improvement. However, later in the next month, uh, his vision dropped to 660. He gives a history of taking the second dose of the vac vaccine earlier the previous month. Fundus fluorescein angiography showed extensive vasculitis and areas of, uh, of non-perfusion. Cystoid macular edema had increased and so had the, the retinal layers. Investigations were revisited and only um, positive finding was a D-dimer, which was uh, 
was high. One month later, at this point, the ATT was continued. The, he received a dose of eccentrics for the anemia. One month later, the vision improved to 615 and OCT still showed edema. At this point, he received the second dose of eccentrics and oral steroid and ATT were continued. Improvement in the cystoid macular edema were noted. Two months later, the vision uh, improved to 6.9 parts and 10 with normal intraocular pressures. Complete resolution of serous macular detachment and CME was noted. However, there was loss in the ellipsoid zone and the external limiting membrane with thinning of the retinal layers and a loss of foveal contour. Fundus fluorescein angiography shows the extensive areas of non-perfusion. So now we have a case of retinal vasculitis with the mantos and quantiferon TB gold positive, started on steroids and ATT, improvement noted. However, there's a flare-up of inflammation following the second dose of the vaccine. The patient initially suspected and treated as tubercular vasculitis following mantos and quantiferon being positive with a good response to ADT. However, needed a re-evaluation following a flare-up of the second COVID vaccination. Suspected immunologic mechanism of retinal vasculitis in a patient with no history of COVID, but inflammation following both doses of the vaccine. This prompted a literature search and a multinational case series by Elaria Te uh, Testi et al. Uh, showed 78 patients who presented with ocular inflammatory events following 14 days of the COVID vaccine. These, they concluded that the ocular events may occur after uh, COVID-19 vaccination. However, these were findings were based only on a temporal association. Earlier on, the um, retinal vasculitis has been reported following vaccination with influenza and diphtheria virus as um, uh, reported by Quark et al. in 2013. Another current literature shows a substantial overlap between the ocular adverse effects of COVID-19 infection and COVID-19 vaccination. Cutaneous vasculitis following COVID vaccination has also been reported in three cases by Kweli, Kaveli et al. following uh, vaccination in healthy individuals. Another report uh, by because so they reported a 46-year-old female with no febrile prodrome who had uh, received the Covaxin 15 days back, presented with palpable purpura over the lower legs, mostly localized in the lower leg, and pitting edema in the ankles. Histopathological examination uh, showed angiocentric inflammation with extravasation of RBC and fibrinoid necrosis of the vessel wall. Covaxin is a whole virion inactivated CoVe2 antigen, which causes uh, systemic immune system activation by cross reactivity and molecular mimicry of cell self antigen causing vasculitis. Now, the vaccine protein is a structural analogous to the wild uh, viral vaccine, which could in induce pro inflammatory cascade similar to that caused by the viral protein. To conclude, the COVID vaccination may serve as an immunological trigger to induce ocular inflammation in system asymptomatic patients. In recent times, ocular inflammation must be correlated with the timing of the COVID infection or vaccine. The uh, ocular tuberculosis in our case may have just been a silent bystander. Thank you. Thank you for an interesting case, Dr. Namita. I have a few questions. Uh, in your case, I mean, this patient, they don't have COVID, no? It was just a no. vaccine, right? Yes. Okay, so how would you uh, uh, account for the D-dimer hike in this particular patient? Did you rule out other causes like serum homocysteine? Yes. Was there any yes. sepsis, liver? We ruled related? out, yes. He was evaluated thoroughly. Homocysteine was normal. ANA was also done. Um, the coagulation profile was also done, which was up, which was normal. The ANA and APLA related mm -hmm. everything work up. That was done. done. Yes. Okay. In view because of the, that is the only thing, all that was yeah, done. Which is a little puzzling for me. Is there anything else which you're missing because of the ex you know, extensive amount of ischemia which was there in this patient and mm -hmm. the persistence of D-dimer being high? 
I would probably look at all causes of DVT kind of, you know, those related issues. Uh, we which did would also probably include cancers as well. Um, okay. You know, if, uh, you know, causing something like this kind of a pattern. I mean, that was, I think that is a very interesting case. So uh, this, these were my thoughts on this case. Okay, and okay. also probably did this patient have any hyperviscosity related disease? Like, for example, no. he moved very high or, uh, you know, that kind of scenario. No. no. The complement levels were okay in this. Phenomenal. Yes. Very interesting. Hmm. Especially the patient had a vaccination, one eye vasculitis. When they took the second vaccine, there was an isolation and the other eye showed symptoms. That is, if you put an arangino scale at all, it should show significant value to attribute. But again, whether it's an exact cause, it's a coincidence. Yeah, because there's already ischemia. We don't have an exact uh, this thing. And what I would like to share is coming to Kalpana's question, uh, vaccine-related induced inflammation cases, we have seen few with increased B-dimer and CRP. It may not be necondate to the disease per se, when the patient has vaccine and they have a reactive uh, presenting with ocular inflammation secondary to the va vaccine sequelae, we did see few cases with raised these parameters, we treat them with anti-inflammatory and some patients anticoagulants. I'm just wondering because we had some cases of vein occlusion and um, I think there was some genetical, I, I I don't know if Dwani is here, uh, probably she can, they found a particular deficiency uh -huh. in one of the... Um, Apla uh, syndrome. Uh, not Apla, the, uh, I think it is one of those anti-protein um, C protein or something like C. I think one gene was deficient or something like that. We had one such case in one of the patients. But uh, I mean, I don't know. I think there is something more which is going on and probably he will need to be referred to a hematologist actually also to look at if there is anything else relating to thrombosis related uh, issues. I mean, that's my take on it. Probably. I had uh, sent this patient to the um, uh, hematologist as well, wanting to rule out any other viscosity syndromes because of the extensive ischemia that resulted. Yeah. So, in just to be on the safer side, that we're looking, at, if we could be looking at something else as well. But we didn't find anything. Else. Yes. Uh, thank you, thank you, Doctor Namita. Um, I'd like you know we are going nearing we are even. Minute. Left. At this point, I take this opportunity to thank Dr. Apurva for presenting the excellent case series, Dr. Dwani for presenting the TV with CIPM, Dr. Amita for the challenging uh, case. Uh, I thank my co-moderator, Dr. Kalpana, and also the keynote speakers of the second session, Dr. Mallika, and who invited talks by Dr. Vedanayaki and Dr. Karpakam, and also the session one speakers. Thank you, one and all, for your active participation. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Karna and Dr. Padma. Thank you. Uh, yes. Ilan, we thank Dr. Ilan and KOS team, and we hand over the hall to the next session.